So I'm going to talk tonight about something called institutional corruption. And let's start by understanding what I mean by institutional corruption by describing a little bit about what it is not. So what I don't mean by institutional corruption is the sort of thing that this man evokes, Blagojevich. I don't mean examples of people engaging in bribery or what Blagojevich called, quote, just politics. Indeed, I don't mean any violation of existing rules. Instead, by institutional corruption, I mean a certain kind of influence, an influence within an economy of influence that has a certain kind of effect. In my terms, something is institutional corruption if it weakens the effectiveness of an institution, this influence within an economy of influence, especially if it weakens public trust of that institution. That's what I mean by institutional corruption. So let's start with a pretty easy case as an example. This institution, <laughs> the United States Congress. There's an extraordinary story told in this fantastic book by Robert Kaiser, So Damn Much Money, about how the influence, the economy of influence that governs Congress has changed dramatically in just the past 20 years. And at the core of the change is the explosion in an industry called lobbying. This explosion produces a certain economy. The core of the economy are lobbyists influencing members, members influencing interests, interests influencing lobbyists. In this economy, each of these entities pays the other. Each depends upon the other. So, for example, interests pay the lobbyists, as Kaiser describes. In earlier generations, enterprising young men came to Washington looking for power and political adventure, often with ambitions to save or reform the country or the world. In the last fourth of the 20th century, such aspirations were supplanted by another familiar American yearning to get rich. So as he describes this industry, an industry now between nine and $12 billion, about the size of the music industry right now, and indeed this one central character, Gerald Cassidy, said to be responsible for the current market around earmarks, a person who has accumulated $100 million in personal wealth from his association with lobbying alone. This industry has dramatically changed Washington, D.C. itself. So as Fox News reports, there's an explosion of wealth inside Washington. Here's a picture of the wealthiest uh, uh, counties in the United States. Notice this conglomeration here, all centering around Washington, D.C. Indeed, by 2007, the top three richest counties in the United States were around Washington, D.C. Nine of the top 20 were around Washington, D.C. And all of this comes from an industry that self-describes its work as the ability to sell policy to those who pay. That's the way interests benefit lobbyists. And then lobbyists benefit members, both during and after their term as members. So during their members, these lobbyists pay with cash. And I don't mean the Blagojevich cash in a brown paper bag. I mean the support for campaigns. As the cost of campaigns has dramatically exploded, members inside this economy become increasingly dependent upon the ability of lobbyists to produce money for their campaigns. It's estimated between 30 and 70 percent of uh, the time congressmen spend is devoted to the task of raising money. These lobbyists then become suppliers, or we could think of them as pushers in this new economy of dependency, pushers, suppliers of the wealth necessary for these members to return to Congress. Now, as Kaiser emphasizes, this too is something new. As he writes, money has been part of American politics forever, on occasion in the Gilded Age of the Harding administration, for example, much more blatantly than recently. But the scale of it has just gotten way out of hand. The money may have come in brown paper bags in earlier eras, but the politicians needed and took much less of it than they take through more formal 
channels today. They need and they take much more. So think of this man, Max Baucus, a man who represents 0.3% of the American population, yet is perhaps the most important man in the Senate controlling health care policy. He opened his coffers to contributors from the health care industry and raised more than $4 million from the health care industry trying to affect his judgment in the consequence in that extremely important debate. Compare that to this man, Mississippi Senator John Stennis, a man who got to the United States Senate not by living life as a choir boy. This is not a man of extraordinarily high ethical standards yet. When Stennis was asked by a colleague to run a fundraiser as the head of the uh, Committee on Armed Services, Stennis responded to the colleague, would that be proper? This is 20 years ago. He said, I hold life and death over these companies. I don't think it would be proper for me to take money from them. Yet this ethic, this notion of restraint, which even survived until 1980 in this sense, disappears completely in the economy that defines Washington today. And then after their time as a member, they too get paid. They get paid by lobbyists with something of future. So as my friend Jim Cooper describes Congress today, Washington and particular Capitol Hill has become a farm league for K Street. Increasingly, members and staffers and bureaucrats have a common business model in mind, focused on their life after government, their life as lawyers. As one study by Public Citizen uh, demonstrated, more than 50% of United States senators uh, between 1998 and 2004 left the Senate to become lobbyists, 42% of members of the House to become lobbyists. And the point is, this economy that they live turns out to be very much like the economy of my law students. They go to work for six to eight years, making about $180,000 or $200,000 a year, hoping to graduate to the partnership position, where they make a half a million dollars or a million dollars a year. Except these are members of Congress being paid $200,000 a year for six to eight years, and then becoming lobbyists in the field in which they have influence. So this is an economy where everybody depends upon this system surviving, and that's the sense in which these lobbyists pay both during and after the time members are in Congress. And then members pay the interests through policy that gets changed, sometimes extraordinarily profitably, as this study from the University of Kansas describes about this statute, the American Jobs Creation Act, they estimated the return on investment from the lobbyist dollars spent to affect the changes in this act and calculated the return on investment was 22,000% for the people who invested in the changes of the statute. And sometimes quite brazenly, this is Congressman John Campbell, a Republican from California, He's a landlord to six used car dealers, earns between $600,000 and $6 million in rent from those car dealers every year. These car dealers and other used car dealers have been very good to Congressman Campbell in his campaigns, raising about $170,000 from these car dealers. And Congressman Campbell has been kind to the car dealers in return, most recently in this statute, the Consumer Financial Protection Act of 2009, a statute designed to create this financial protection agency for consumers involved in credit transactions. What Congressman Campbell did was succeed in getting an exemption for used car dealers from the protection of this statute. Of course, nobody has ever had any credit problems with used car dealers, so there's no reason for there to be any consumer protection here. And then if you look at the fundamental question about how such an exemption gets imposed in the statute, we should look at the Democrats, of course, because they are the majority here. And in fact, as MapLight has demonstrated today, an organization studies the relationship between money and politics, the Democrats who defected and supported John Campbell's shift to get used car dealers exempted received two times the contribution from car dealers that those Democrats who didn't defect got. Now, despite that story, politicians deny the claim that money affects results. 
as one politician told me, it's ridiculous. Maybe it affects access. So Representative Mazzoli describes, people who contribute get the ear of the member and the ear of the staff. They have access, and access is it. Access is power. But as this representative told me, it doesn't change the results. Now, I find this pretty hard to believe, <laughs> at least if you accept a principle of charity in interpreting what Congress does. Because if you think about easy cases that Congress faces, the kind of two plus two equals four questions that Congress gets to decide and they get wrong, it's hard to understand their error unless there's something else in the field other than judgment. So for example, think about a field that I spent about 12 years of my life focusing on uh, copyright change. Um, my focus here as an activist began in 19, uh, 1998, when Congress enacted a statute in honor of this extraordinary American, uh, Sonny Bono. The Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act extended the term of existing copyrights and future copyrights by 20 years. Now, when Congress enacted that statute, its job was to ask the question, would this extension advance the public good? And as we know about copyright, copyright is a monopoly given in exchange for creating something. And so long as we live in a universe that doesn't have the laws of nature that Star Trek taught us, we know that incentives are prospective. So not even the United States Congress can get George Gershwin to do anything more. So there could be no possible reason to extend the term of an existing copyright, regardless of the desire to extend it for future copyrights. Indeed, when we challenge the statute in the Supreme Court, a brief written by a bunch of economists, including Nobel Prize winners, five Nobel Prize winners, was signed by one liberal Nobel Prize winner, oh wait, I'm sorry, this is Milton Friedman, right-wing Nobel Prize winning economist, who said he would only join the brief if the word no-brainer was in the brief somewhere. <laughs> So clear was it that this could not advance the public good. Yet apparently there were no brains in this place when Congress overwhelmingly ratified the statute. An easy public policy question which Congress gets wrong. Or think about this area, which I'm thinking about a lot more in my research nutrition. There's a consensus among those who know something about the matter that we eat too much of this stuff, not enough of this stuff. 2003, the World Health Organization decided it would like to advance public policy on the basis of this consensus. So it set a standard that said no more than 10% of your daily caloric intake should come from added sugar. Well, the sugar industry, they have this sweet little logo here, they went ballistic, that they are ballistic. <laughs> they got the United States Senate to threaten to withdraw funding from the WHO if it didn't back down from its absurd recommendation of just 10% of your daily caloric intake coming from added sugar. They, of course, had scientific basis for their view that 25% of your daily caloric intake should come from added sugar. Well, threats of the United States notwithstanding, the WHO did not back down on its claim, but the United States government did. In 2003, the Food Nutrition Board changed their standards to say that you could take 25% of your daily caloric intake from added sugar. That's a balanced diet according to our government. So this is how you can eat Fruit Loops for breakfast or M&Ms, a glass of milk, a cheeseburger for lunch, pepperoni pizza, indeed three slices of pepperoni pizza, and of course, sugar cookies for dessert. That's a balanced diet according to our government. Once again, an easy public policy question which our government just gets wrong. Or maybe most profoundly, think about the debate around global warming. There's of course a consensus that we're doing it, as Gore described the consensus. The debate's over. There are five points of the consensus. Number one, global warming is real. Number two, we human beings are mainly responsible. Number three, consequences are very bad. Number four, we need to fix it quickly. And number five, it's not too late. They decided they wanted to evaluate how strong that consensus was in first the peer-reviewed academic community. So they did a selection of 1,000 peer-reviewed articles published between 1993 and 2003. And they discovered 0%, exactly zero, of those articles questioned that consensus. Then they did an equivalent study 
of articles published in popular media sources between roughly the same period, 1988 to 2002. And they discovered that 53% of those articles questioned the basic consensus. And of course, the difference between these two fields is a consequence of the enormous money spent on junk science, giving our government the cover it needs to delay, I thought 10 years, but it looks like even longer, addressing this, the most important public policy problem that our planet faces. Once again, easy public policy question that we get wrong. Now, the government either gets these questions wrong because they're idiots or because they're guided by something other than reason. And in my view, controversial though this might be, is that Congress is not a bunch of idiots. And the hard problem here is that, of course, it's not just easy cases that government considers. If they get it this bad in easy cases, think about the extraordinary range of hard cases where judgment doesn't allow itself to prevail. So policy is bent to those who pay in an increasingly universally defined way. That's the way members pay interests. Now, Kaiser's point is you've got to see these together. You've got to see them as an economy, an economy that has an effect. And from my perspective in institutional corruption, it fits both components. Number one, it weakens the effectiveness of the institution as we think of the inability of Congress to deal with this array of issues from the most important to the most annoying because it can't get attention to these issues because of this economy. And number two, by weakening public trust of the institution. There is an enormous cynicism about this institution in our country today. The latest polls show that 22% of the American public have a positive view of Congress. There were probably more people who supported the British crown at the time of the revolution than support our Congress today. In California, 88% of people believe money buys results in Congress. In North Carolina, it's a five to one majority to the same conclusion that money buys results. And it's that view that feeds this extraordinary cynicism. This is the paradigm example of what I mean by institutional corruption. It's perhaps, in some sense, the most important. But the question that I've been thinking about is whether there are others that we should worry about. Plenty are alleged, but how would we know where this model of institutional corruption extends beyond this core paradigmatic case? So some talk about medicine, for example. Think about the pharmaceutical industry, an industry which in 2005 consumed $200 billion of our economy. $15.7 billion of that was spent on promoting prescription drugs. And about $5 billion of that promotion budget was in something called detailing. Now, detailing is basically the process by which doctors are convinced to use one drug over the other. And for most of the history of detailing, it was through a process of giving out samples and gifts, as one detailer described it. The essence of pharmaceutical gifting is, quote, bribes that aren't considered bribes. While it's the doctor's job to treat patients and not to justify their actions, it's my job to constantly sway the doctors. It's a job I'm paid and trained to do. Doctors are neither trained nor paid to negotiate. Most of the time, they don't even realize that's what they're doing. Now, the claims about this having an effect on the actual practice of prescribing medicine are, in fact, quite complex claims. The claims that they affect changes, indeed, are quite complex. And there's a question we need to ask about whether the claims are true. And more fundamentally, what would it take to know whether they were true? Or think in the context of agencies of the federal government. Of course, regulators in our government are constantly in the business of applying rules uh, based on the facts. And a question that agencies face is how do we protect the process of finding the facts? Well, a very interesting case decided by the Supreme Court in 2008 addressed a corner of this question. In this case, Exxon Shipping versus Baker. The court was asked whether the Constitution or federal common law should limit the amount of punitive damages which could be awarded in the context of an admiralty case. And in deciding that there would be such a limit, the court dropped this footnote. It said, the court is aware of a body of literature running parallel 
to anecdotal reports examining the predictability of punitive awards by conducting numerous, quote, mock juries where different jurors are confronted with the same hypothetical case. But as the court continued, because this research was funded in part by Exxon, we decline to rely upon it. So the fact that it was funded in part by an entity affected by the decision meant that the evidence would be excluded from the court's consideration of the ultimate resolution of the case. Now, many people looked at this decision and said it was an admirable effort to protect the process of decisions by the Supreme Court. But others, especially from administrative law, looked at this and thought it was a little bit precious. Because if you take this standard, the standard it was funded in part by the industries regulated, agencies rely upon studies funded in part by the industries regulated all the time. So there are lots of examples. Here's one. The history of the regulation of a chemical called chromium-6. Chromium-6 used to be used in the chrome plating factories. And in these factories, new workers were introduced to their job through a trick called the dime trick that old workers would demonstrate to these new workers. The old workers would take a dime and pass it from one side of the nostril to another through the hole that had developed in the middle because of the chemicals that they were exposed to. This cued some people in to the possibility that chromium-6 might be dangerous. And so OSHA conducted a study and in 1976 stated it is concluded that a comprehensive occupational health standard is urgently needed, emphasis in the original, to protect employees. And they promised to complete that in the shortest possible time. That's 1976. The standard which OSHA promulgated was promulgated in 2006. And this 30-year delay, which literally caused thousands of deaths because it's not just separation, that's not just holes in the nose, it's also an extraordinary amount of cancer caused by this chemical. This delay was caused by studies funded in part by the industries regulated. So it's not just here, of course, that we have this problem in agencies. It's across the spectrum of agencies. And what we should be asking from this perspective of institutional corruption is whether this structure of fact-finding has corrupted the very process by which fact-finding is to be conducted. And what would it take for us to be able to say that that corruption has occurred? Or finally, one more example. Think about journalism. There's a great book coming out in the spring by uh, Robert McChesney and John Nichols called The Death and Life of American Journalism. And it describes what we all know about, uh, which is the extraordinary de decline in major American newspapers, which of course are the support we need for a critical institution in American democracy, which is journalism. Now most people think it's the internet, or this sweet guy, Craig Newmark, who started Craigslist, who is responsible for that extraordinary decline. And as Nichols and McChesney argue, of course, the effect of the internet is real. But the interesting part of this book is they demonstrate that the real decline happens or begins long before the internet, as they describe. The big change came in the late 70s and 80s when large corporate chains accelerated the long-term trend to gobble up daily newspapers. So the claim of the book is that this is a change tied to the structure of ownership of media entities. As they say, quoting David Simon, when locally based family owned newspapers were consolidated into publicly owned newspaper chains, an essential trust between journalism and the community served was betrayed. So the structure of their claim, again, is a type of ownership corrupts the institution, fits the model. Influence within an economy of influence is weakening the effectiveness and weakening public trust of the institution asking, begging again the question, what would it take to know whether the claim is true? Now the point is, in each of these areas, it's plausible that this kind of corruption exists. It fits the form. But we need more than intuitions in answering the question whether there is institutional corruption here. We have, a, we have to have a framework within which we can understand, a metric to know, because we each have our ideological commitments in these spaces to see or not to see a certain kind of corruption, but we need a way to escape this ideology. That's the aim of the project that I was uh, 
well, really forced by uh, President Fowles to come back here to Harvard um, to pursue. Of course, I'm very happy to be here, uh, but that's the aim of this project at the Safra uh, Foundation Center for Ethics, um, or what we're thinking of as the lab at the Safra Center, to build a neutral ground, a framework within which we can begin to know whether and when we have an example of institutional corruption, whether and when it exists, and to begin to develop practical remedies for institutional corruption when we can say that it exists. Now, as I've described this project and described pulling my family from California and moving them back to Boston, many people have said, why? <laughs> or, why now? And I want to close by giving one view of an answer to that question, a view that focuses on a question of responsibility. So all of you know this image that was generated just after March 24th, 1989, when a ship under the command of Joseph, Joseph Hazelwood run aground and spilled about 11 million gallons of oil into Prince William Sound. This is a recording of Captain Hazelwood just after the ship ran aground. So you're notified over. Now, as that recording might suggest, there was a question raised about whether Captain Hazelwood was intoxicated at the time that he was captaining the ship. He said that he'd had four vodkas before he got on the ship, but the blood alcohol level after the accident indicated he must have been at least six times the legal limit when he got aboard the ship that night. He denied it, there was a huge fight about it, and there's therefore, because there was a fight, doubt about whether he was drunk. But what there was no doubt about was that Hazelwood had a severe problem with alcoholism. His mother testified he had a severe problem with alcoholism. I do know that he had a problem with alcohol in the past, she told investigators. 1985, Exxon treated him for alcoholism. But in 89, after the accident, Exxon's president said he had thought he mastered the problem. They hadn't noticed that in 1986, he had had his driver's license revoked for a DUI. And in 1988, he had had his driver's license revoked for a DUI. In fact, at the time he was captaining the Valdez, he was not permitted to drive a VW Beetle because he was not permitted to drive a car. Now, I want you to forget the anger you might have towards Captain uh, Hazelwood. I want you to think about those around him, the other officers on that ship who could have picked up a phone, people who, while a drunk was driving a super tanker, did nothing about it. What should we think about them? I ask this question because as I think around the range of problems that we as a society face, I begin to worry that we are they. These critical problems that we face requiring serious attention, we face at a time when critical institutions are incapable of that attention. Because they are distracted, unable to focus, like pilots playing solitaire on their laptop when they should be landing in Minnesota, like a surgeon calling for a tea time in the middle of a surgery, like half of you with your cell phones as you're driving around Boston. We face these critical problems requiring serious attention. Yet we have no capable institutions to address them because we've allowed these institutions to become distracted. Who is to blame for that? Who is responsible for that? Our norm is to point responsibility here 
to people like that, I think that's a mistake. It's not the evil people we need to focus on. It's the good people. It's the decent people. It's the people who could pick up a phone. It is us. We, the most privileged in the society, we could fix this. Because the most outrageous part is that the corruptions that I've described here are primed by the most privileged and permitted by the passivity of the most privileged as well. Thank you very much.